energy levels of Wilmore surfaces. So good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here for the first time in Rio. So I'm going to talk about energy level of Wilmore surfaces and more precisely about the energy level where you lose compactness. And I will give a short motivation for this. So if you have a functional, um, and what we study is we pick a sequence u n of critical points, so such that e prime u n is zero, and we assume that u n is non compact. Then we are interested in the limit of the energy. What are those critical levels of energy in some sense? Critical because we, we lose compactness. So what is this limit? Why it is interesting? Because if you are able to characterize those levels, and for instance, if you are able to say that they are discrete, then you can perform variational methods such as min max. You take two points, two relative minimum, you look to all curves between those two points, and if you are sure that your level, your min max level is in between those level where you lose compactness, then you are in good shape to have new examples, saddle point, for instance. So that's why it is very important to understand those level of energy. And so my talk is divided in seven parts. First of all, of course, I will introduce the Wilmore functional and much uh, basic materials. Then I will introduce you to the conservation laws, which are very powerful, powerful tools from the analytic point of view and it will give us a so-called epsilon regularity and the first compactness result. Then I would like to speak to something well-known but uh, very instructive, and since there is many graduate students, I think it's a good idea to speak about the control of the conformal factor. And here it's nothing about Wilmore, it's just when your second fundamental form is bounded in L2, then you can control the, the um, conformal factor. And then we will come to the main part of the talk, which is about uh, energy density, uh, when the conformal, so for the Wilmore, when the conformal class is bounded, but not also when the conformal class is unbounded. And in this part, we will going to introduce new flux, which will be able, uh, which will be useful in the last part where we give a new compactness result for um, uh, Wilmore surfaces. And I forget to say that everything is in a joint work with Tristan Rivière. So, Let's start. So if you want to measure the bending of a surface, then it's next, you need to look to the extrinsic curvature, and you need a global object, and in the 20s, Blaschke defined this functional, the integral of h squared dv. Then in the 60s, uh, Wilmore proved that the round sphere is the minimum, is the only one, and from that time, we call all critical points Wilmore surfaces. So one um, very important fact about this functional, it, has, it is conformally invariant. It's in the sense that if you take a Mobius transformation of R3, and you move your surface by this conformal transformation, then that doesn't change the Wilmore energy. Uh, sometimes people uh, like me prefer to look to this functional, the integral of A naught square, which is strictly equivalent to the previous one because the difference is just made by a topological term. But here, it's of course conformally invariant, but not only the integral, but the integrand also is conformally invariant, which is quite important when you look to conservation laws. So what we know about uh, Wilmore surfaces? For sphere, we have a sphere in R3. We have a complete classification due to Robert Bryant which says that the level of energy are multiplied multiply of four pi, except for k equal two, three, five, and seven. In particular, so you have your own sphere, and the next step is 16 pi. Um, we, you have a similar result uh, in R4 due to Montiel. In R4, you have eight pi of energy. For, you have sphere which reach the eight pi. For Tori, the minimum is achieved, and it's uh, the solution of the famous Wilmore conjecture by Neves and Marquez that it is achieved by the Clifford Torres. 
We have also infinitely many tori in S3, so an ER3, thanks to the stratigraphic projection. You can build it like this. You take a curve on S2, so this is S2. You lift, you lift that curve via the up vibration to S3, and that gives you a tori. And the tori is will more if and only if the curve is the critical point of the this energy, the geodesic curvature square plus one. And uh, they are called elastic curves. And we know that there is infinitely many elastic curves, so you have infinitely many Wilmore tori. And for higher genus, less is known. We know that the minimum is achieved uh, in any co-dimension, but uh, we don't really know who they are. We expect that there are lots of examples, but that's all. There is also a lot of work of the German school, but using uh, totally different uh, methods, like integral system, I won't speak about. Um, so, what is the Euler Lagrange equation? The classical Euler Lagrange equation for Wilmore is Laplace h equal plus 2h h square minus k. So, here you are faced with the first problem is that your Laplacian here depends on the metric, but the metric depends on the immersion because this is a pullback of the Euclidean metric. So, this is a classical problem when you look to some geometric problem because you have some invariance by reparameterization, so you have to kill it by cho choosing what we call a gauge. Uh, here, a good choice of parameterization seems to be uh, the conformal one, because in this parameterization, your Laplacian becomes proportional to the flat one. So multiplying by the conformal factor, then your main term is just a flat Laplacian and you have a nice elliptic equation. Now you are faced with a second problem, that here the main term of the right side is H cube, and you have absolutely no control on H cube because by hypothesis you only control H square. So from the analysis point of view, uh, you can say nothing for a priori estimate. And so I have to uh, now introduce, because we are speaking about degenerating of the conformal class. So you know that, so we have an immersion, a conformal immersion and that fix a conformal class on your base surface. And you know that in each conformal class, you can pick a metric with constant curvature, let's say zero, one, or minus one, depending on the genus. The question is, what happens when the conformal class degenerates? So for k equal one, nothing, because you have only one conformal class. But for k equal zero, your base surface becomes a long, thin cylinder, like this, or if you want to look at it in the molecular space of tori, your tori is generating by this unit vector, and one vector we goes to infinity, so it's a long rectangle. And what happens when uh, the genus is bigger than two? So we have a nice description, thanks to Dolin Munford, which says that morally, your surface is going to split in thick and thin part. So on thick part, the, the injective the radius is bonded from below, and you have thin part which correspond to shrinking geodesic, uh, where of course your uh, injectivity radius is, is uh, going to zero. So for instance, you, you have a genus to surface, and when you go to the boundary of the model space, it can look like this. So here it's very long, very thin, and at the end, the limit is disconnected. You have two genus one surface with each one a cusp. But here in this region, called the collar region, we have a very nice description. We know that every collar region, so thin part, are isometric to um, hyperbolic cylinder. So or if you look to in H, in the hyperbolic, um, half plane, it's like if you take uh, a neighbor bowed of a geodesic. So we have a nice parameterization of this those thin part. And the thin part is okay since the injectivity radius is bonded from below. Um, now I have to introduce um, an analytic tool, which is the Wente inequality. So, um, because, um, we'll see. So 
If you look to this equation with a and b in w12 and Laplace phi equal a x b y minus c y b x, a priori the left, the right hand side is in L1 and you, you can't say anything. But it's a Jacobian, so we have an improved regularity which says that we control phi into L infinity and the gradient of phi into L2 times a universal constant times the energy of A times the energy of B. So this is what we call compactness by compensation because there is a compensation phenomena in the Jacobian term. And now I would like to introduce from also the analytic point of view the Lorentz species. So I give the precise definition, but don't be worried. We don't need this definition. Just what we need is to know that Lorentz spaces are sophistication of LP spaces. In particular, we have our preferred LP spaces L2. And there is a bigger space called the weak L2 space and a smaller one, L2-1. So, of course, there is always bigger and smaller space, but those ones share the same um, scaling invariance. And L2 infinity is really bigger. It contains 1 over R, and L2-1 is really smaller because it is a dual of L2. And those space are, from the analytic point of view, good, the good one to deal with problem like geometric problem, like isoperimetric problem, because one to inequality can be seen as uh, an analytic version of the isoperimetric inequality. And especially we have a refined one to inequality, which says that your gradient is not only in uh, L2, but in L2-1. So here I finish with analytic premier, pre preliminaries. And we can start the study of the Wilmore functional. So for this, we need a rational space. We, oh, yes. So you have, on your surface, you take a metric, and a fixed metric, and you can define subolef spaces that doesn't depend on the metric. It's not hard to see. And now you pick a map in W1 infinity, and you want that this might be an immersion in a weak sense. So for this, you, you ensure that it is comparable to your fixed metric. And then, once you have this, you can define a Gauss map, a weak Gauss map, phi x, y, phi y over the norm of phi x over phi y. And uh, the space in which we are going to work is a space of weak immersion. That is to say, you are in W1 infinity, your metric, your probability metric is non-degenerate, and the second fundamental form, that is to say the gradient of the Gauss map, is in L2. Okay? So now we are in, we can start. So now I will speak about conservation law, and we are back one century ago. With the famous theorem of Hemi Nothra, we which says that if you have an action, LU, of L, X, U, X, D, U, in the simple case, which act on the C1 function of a domain omega into a smooth, smooth uh, sum manifold. And on that sum manifold, you have a vector field X, which is an infinitesimal symmetry for the action. What does it mean? X generates a flow, phi T, X, and you want that your action is invariant under the flow. So x of u equal LU. Then, for every critical point of u, you have um, a conservation law, a divergence-free quantity, which is here, divergence of rho x dl over dq equals zero. So now you can apply this to Wilmore, because Wilmore is invariant by a Mobius transformation. So you have three uh, infinitesimal um, invariants, uh, translation, dilation, and rotation. So here, is W is a classical Wilmore equation. So if we are a critical point, we can assume that W is zero and everything, everything is zero here. So if we define T, this vector field, then we are Wilmore. If we are Wilmore, we have divergence of T equals zero, divergence of T scalar pi equals zero, divergence of, so this one is a scalar one, is due to dilation. And this one is due to rotation, is divergence of t wedge phi plus 2h nabla phi equals zero. And we have three conservation laws. And we can start to make analysis. So in particular, we have a new definition of Wilmore surfaces. So yes, here I will work on a disk, because everything which I'm going to tell is local. 
And we are in R3 because notation are simpler, but everything is true in arbitrary two dimension. And so you can reformulate uh, the, um, to be Wilmore in the following way. Phi, a conformal weak immersion is Wilmore if and only if you satisfy this divergence free uh, equation. But you have al also two other divergence free quantity that you can integrate because you are on a disk, you have a point carry lemma that generate two curl S and R and you play with all these three equations and what you get at the end of the day is, oh, no. Doesn't, yes, think, ah, I'm too far. Uh, is this system of equation? So if you look to the two first ones, there are an autonomous system in S and R and um, on the right hand side, you have only Jacobian term, which depend on R, S, and N. So here using T, you can prove all the regularity and all the estimates you want. And now you have a third equation which permit to reinject this regularity and th those estimates to get estimate on, on your emission phi. But the problem is, is for controlling phi, you must control nabla phi. But this is absolutely not surprising because Wilmore is dilution invariant so there is no, uh, a priori you have no control on nabla phi because you can take the immersion, dilate it, and you increase the, the nabla phi. So you, you have to deal with the control of the conformal factor first, but once it's done, you can prove all estimates and all a priori estimates you want thanks to this system of equation. So in particular, we have this, so so-called epsilon regularity. So this idea goes back to sachs ullenbeck when they study minimal immersion of the sphere. So, and the philosophy of epsilon regularity is more or less that under a certain level of energy, everything is under control. So you have this theorem, which says that if you take a weak conformal immersion, you are below some level of energy epsilon zero plus this extra assumption, which will be raised in few slides, but for the moment we don't control the conformal factor, so I should put this assumption. Then, up to controlling the conformal factor here, which of course um, is not done yet, you control all derivative of phi in up to reduce a bit the size of your disk. So if you are below epsilon zero on the disk, you control and you control the conformal factor, then you control every derivative of phi, of your immersion. And this permits to prove a first uh, compactness result. Um, so I will make a picture, clear picture of this. So this first compactness result, say, so here is your base surface. You have a sequence of Wilmore immersion. What can happen? A priori, the energy can concentrate, but only infinitely many points, because at each point you concentrate, you have at least epsilon zero of energy. So you have bad points here. And far from the bad, this bad point, if you control uh, the conformal factor, then you control everything. So you can pass to the limit, and you find a limit surface. So phi k converge far from this point to some Wilmore surfaces. Now, what's happened around those points where, a priori, the energy concentrates? Classically, when you have some concentration phenomena, what you do, you rescale. So you look in a little neighborhood, and you rescale your parameterization, so that, that blows your base surface into a plan. And you have a rescale phi k around this. A priori, perhaps you have new point of concentration, but still many, infinitely many. Far from the point, you pass to the limit, and you converge to an immersion from R2 to R3, which will be called a bubble, which more or less up to inversion looks like a, not a round sphere, but a Wilmore sphere. Uh, so this is a bubble. So I have said, perhaps you have other point of 
concentration, so you restart, you redilate, you re rescale, but the process stops. And what you are going to produce is what we call the bubble tree. That is to say, around the point of concentration, you extract bubble, bubble over bubble, but at the end, it stops. And in the image, it looks like something like this. Here you have one sphere, another sphere. So they are not a priori round sphere because a, a Wilmot sphere is not a priori round. But and here is your image. So what you want to understand, uh, so that's what says this uh, theorem, that far from finitely many points, we have a limit surface. And what I'm explaining here is you concentrate bubble around those points. So you understand very well your surface uh, far, far from the point of concentration, and very well also at the scale of concentration, because when you rescale, then you have a strong limit, which is a bubble, which are classified, so there is no problem. The question is, what happens in between? Do we have everybody? I mean, do we lose energy in between? Or what happens, how you glue this bubble to your surface. So this is called this region where you are close with respect to one to the point of concentration but far with respect to the scale of dilation is, is called a neck region. And the question is to understand what's happened in the neck region. Especially do we lose energy or no? Or is the energy, the limit of the energy is equal to the limit of this limit, the, the energy of this limit surface plus the energy of the bubble you blow. So I give a precise definition here, which is just what I sum up saying uh, an energy density is just when you have a limit surface, phi infinity, minus some bubble, then the total energy must go to, to zero. That's what we are looking for. This is really important because we know exactly the energy of the limit bubble, they are Wilmot sphere, so it's 4 pi times k, and then we will know that we will prove that the level of energy where you lose compactness are quantized. So between those levels you will have compactness. So now I will shortly explain how we control the conformal factor. It's something rather classical but quite interesting is in, it's independent of being Wilmore. It's just if you bond the second, uh, the L2 norm of the second fundamental form, then you will have some control of the conformal factor of your weak immersion. So first you have this theorem which make my uh, hypothesis free now, which says that if you have a weak immersion and you control the L2 norm of the second fundamental form, then the gradient of the conformal factor in the weak space is bounded. It depends only on A and H, your, your um, constant curvature metric. And it's rather easy to prove. You just write the classical equation of the conformal factor, Laplace lambda equal exponential to lambda, the Gauss curvature of your immersion minus the Gauss curvature of your base manifold. Now you apply green, uh, green identity, lambda equal green uh, convolution with the right hand side, you take the gradient and you apply Young inequality. No, first you remark that the right hand side is bounded in L1 thanks to your hypothesis here and the fact KH is 0, 1 or minus 1. And now you apply Young inequality which is true for uh, L Lorentz space because we have interpolation so everything that is true for LP spaces is true for uh, Lorentz spaces, and you control uh, the weak L2 norm of gradient lambda by the weak L2 norm of gradient GH times this term which is bounded in L1. So you just have to control the green function. And this is for free, why? Because the green function is like logarithm and its gradient is like 1 over R, and as I explained in the beginning, 1 over R is in the weak L2 space, so it's okay. But of course, it will depend on H because the behavior of the green function depends on the conformal class. Now, we have a better estimate. So all those results I know from Elin, Miller-Zverak, 
and they are rewrite th that way by Rivière, which says that if you have still a conformal uh, weak immersion, and you pick, so on your surface, a simply connected domain on which the energy is no bigger than 8 pi over 3. Then you can reparameterize your domain in order to have some Harnack inequality on the, um, on the conformal factor. And of course, you have to reparameterize your domain because if you take an horrible parameterization, you won't have any Harnack uh, inequality. And how you prove that? So uh, let's assume that omega is disk, k is um, the half ball. Uh, first of all, what you are going to do is just not to choose good coordinates, but to choose a um, good frame. So here is my domain omega. I have my phi here. So here is my piece of surface, phi omega. And on that surface, I look to every autonomal frame, E1, E2. And I minimize, I take the one that minimize the energy. It is called the Coulomb frame, and it satisfies this equation. And when you have a Coulomb frame, it's easy to see that this frame is integrable, that up to a conformal factor, exponential 2u E1, exponential 2u E2 equals 0, is just equivalent to this equation. So this best frame can be integrated. So there exists a parameterization of your domain here, which corresponds to this optimal frame. And in this optimal frame, now you have a new conformal factor, and you can write the equation of the conformal factor. And the equation of the conformal factor be becomes Laplace U equal nab nabla E1, nabla per P2. So the right hand side is still in L1, but it's much better because it's Jacobian. And now you can apply 1T, or you can't apply directly 1T because uh, Laplace U tilde, uh, because you need a boundary directly data. So you apply it to U tilde, and for U tilde, you have U tilde is in L infinity. Now you have to control U minus U tilde, but U minus U tilde is just an harmonic function, and to get Harnack inequality for harmonic function is something classical. So I skip the end of the proof, which says just at the end that since u tilde is bounded in L infinity, u minus u tilde satisfy Harnack, then u satisfy Harnack. So up to a constant, it's bounded in L infinity. What does it mean here? So let's come back to our picture where the energy concentrates at some point. And I have said that if we control the conformal factor far from this point, then we have very strong convergence. But how you control the conformal factor? It's not free. You have to kill the invariance by um, Mobius transformation, because you can always dilate or concentrate your surface. So what you do is that you pick two points, and you put the image of your two points at di distance one by multiplying by one over the distance of phi k a, phi k b here. So now your conformal factor can't blow down. Because if you blow down somewhere, it blow down uniformly because of Harnack, so it can't blow down. But it can blow up because your surface can be, uh, can go to infinity. And the area can go to infinity. But what you can prove easily thanks to monotony city formula of uh, Leon Simon is that your surface is not going to fill the whole space. So you will have somewhere a, a ball which will never meet the surface. And what you do, you make an inversion with respect to this ball, and you are going to put all your surface in that ball. So now you apply an inversion. And now your new surface is bounded, and you apply once more the Leon Simon a monotony formula, which uh, if you are bounded, will more bounded, the area is bounded, so the conformal factor can blow down. So up to use this conformal transformation, then your conformal factor now is absolutely under control. Just using that uh, L2 norm of the um, second fundamental form is bounded. Here we, we never use the fact to be Wilmore. Wilmore is just useful to get epsilon regularity. And uh, so 
So that's the way you control the conformal factor. So now we have this limit, this weak limit in some sense. We decompose our surface into a weak limit plus some bubble. And we would like to understand what's happened between the bubble. So do we have energy identity? So first, um, I have to speak about this result, which if in fact it's at the beginning of, of the, um, our work. Uh, we, we proved uh, several years ago that every conformal invariant problem of order two in dimension two satisfy an energy identity, including harmonic maps, geomorphic curve, or CMC surfaces. Of course, those results was already known, but each one was proved with a specific tool. Here, we prove all these results just using the conformal invariance of the problem. And that allows us to uh, generalize the proof to higher dimension, proving also energy identity for biomimic map, but also to higher order problem like Wilmore, which is the first fourth order problem. And, um, and the idea of the proof is quite simple. Uh, it just relies on the um, L infinity, L21 duality. Because as I said, those space, L2 weak especially, is a good space in order to study this problem. Why? Because in, it's very easy to prove that in the neck, in the neck, it's something free. That your gradient of your function is always a little o of 1 over r. Be why? Because if you multiply here by r, this quantity is scale invariant. So because this quantity is scale invariant, you have for free this estimate. And then because 1 over r is in the weak L2, and not in L2, but in the weak L2, then you know that the energy of your function is going to zero with respect to the weak L2. So you just have to prove L21 estimate because you have you, the duality. And L2 and estimate come from the one inequality, as I as explained, plus some estimate on the harmonic, uh, on the harmonic function on the generating annula. So just after proving this theorem, Bernard and Rivière, using this technique, they prove the first energy identity for Wilmore. That is to say, assuming that the conformal class is bounded, then they have this following identity. The limit of the energy is equal to the energy of your limit plus the energy of all the bubble you blow here. And uh, first consequence is that you have compactness below this uh, beta g plus 4 pi. That is to say, uh, beta g is the infinimum in the class of um, immersion of genus g. So if you are below, if you have a sequence of Wilmore surfaces below this level, you are sure that you are compact. So uh, now, how to drop the, the hypothesis on the conformal class? First of all, you are faced with first difficulty. Because uh, in my estimate of the conformal factor, I use an L2 weak estimate on the green function. But the green function depends on the metric, which depends on the conformal class, of course. And a priori, and it is well studied, uh, the green function blows up when the conformal class blows up. It's something you can see easily. Uh, looking to your green function, a green function, you can write it formally like this, phi i x, phi uh, i y over lambda y, where phi i, is eigenfunction of your Laplace operator and uh, lambda i are the eigenvalue. So when you your conformal class degenerates, your surface can become disconnected. If you become disconnected, your lambda one is going to zero, of course, because at the limit you have a disconnected surface and uh, the first eigenvalue of the Laplace operator is zero because you can put just plus one here, minus one here, and it is zero. So it is something very well known for the people of uh, uh, arithmetic and uh, hyperbolic geometry uh, that uh, the green function of hyperbolic manifold, uh, hyperbolic surface whose conformal class is degenerating blows up uniformly. 
but uh, so there is a lot of study of this kind of green function, but nobody have looked to the gradient. So we prove that for the gradient, up, for the gradient of a sequence of um, Riemann surface whose conformal class is not a priori bounded, the gradient stay bounded, the L2 norm, the L2 weak norm of the gradient is uniformly bounded uh, independently of the conformal class. So um, now we control also the conformal factor where the conformal class degenerates. So we can try to prove an energy identity uh, when the conformal class degenerates. So here is the result. So it's almost the same except this big assumption, I will explain. So you consider uh, a, a sequence of weak immersion uh, whose conformal class is potentially uh, degenerating. So you have uh, some degenerating geodesic. And you assume that this integral, this residue, uh, divide by the square root of the length of the geodesic goes to zero. So I will explain where it comes from. So it's an horrible formula, of course. If you have this extra assumption, then you have at the limit um, an energy density, that is to say, that's the limit of the energy. The limit of, here I write the once limit surface, it's not tr true because you have several, if it can be disconnected, but uh, plus the energy of all the bubble. And you can have also bubbles inside the collar. Uh, can have bubble here that appear in the cylinder in your hyperbolic. Uh, so I won't absolutely not detail this proof, but I will explain where come from those residues because I think they will be uh, very helpful uh, in, the, um, in the following. So where they come from? When you prove an energy density, uh, or when, when you study your immersion on a surface whose conformal class is not degenerating, it's not very hard, you cover your surface by small disk and you make the study in each disk. Of course, when the conformal class degenerates, you can't do it anymore because your injectivity radius is going to zero. So in the collar region, you can't cover it by disk. You have to use the fact that it's an annulus which, which de degenerates. So when you come back to your conservation laws, when you integrate those conservation laws, then it produces residue because your domain is not anymore simply connected. So each one produces a residue, C, C0, C1. And here you have formula for C, C0, C1. The one of the theorem, the one you must control in each, around each shrinking geodesic is C1. So C, it doesn't play any role and it is not surprising because it is not a geometric quantity in the following sense, that is morally proportional to H. So when you dilate your surface e by lambda, is multiplied by one over lambda. So it is not invariant by dilation. So since it is not a geometric quantity, that's uh, normal that it doesn't play any role. C0 and C1 are uh, dilation invariant. And all, uh, I should say conformally invariant. So, and they are really geometric quantity which play the same roles and flux formula for CMC. <laughs> so prob probably you know that you have flux formula for CMC, but I can reprove it really quickly, that if you're on an annulus and you write your CMC equation, H equal one, in conformal coordinate, it is right Laplace U equal to U X wedge U Y, which you can rewrite in divergence form for free. And now if you integrate this, you have the flux on this circle, say one equal to the flux. I want to write the formula, but that says that if you look to the image, you have the CMC surface, then you have a flux here that must be compensated by a flux here. And those, so, so the, the famous flux for CMC come 
exactly from the integration of an annulus, if you want, of a divergence free quantity. So C0 and C1 play that role, and they are conformal invariant, which is really, um, really important. For instance, um, so I have to produce examples where those quantities are non-vanishing in order to prove that they are non-trivial. So if we come back to our hope tori, and you compute C1 on those hope tori uh, given by Pinkhole, uh, Wilmore hope tori, uh, the flux, this flux is, is zero if and only if your uh, tori is minimal. That is to say, uh, it is a Clifford torus. In some sense, those residues they capture the fact that your surface, um, your surface, your will more surface come from a minimal surfaces. Of course, they are null on sphere, but we know that all will more sphere are just stereographic projection of uh, or inversion or what you want of uh, minimal surfaces with flat end. So, for spheres, they are always zero. For the optori, we compute that uh, the only times the residue vanish, it is when it is a minimal tori. And so I have the following expectation that if, um, if I take any minimal surfaces in a conformally flat space, or at least in model space, those residue vanish. And so this is not totally clear for the moment. At least it's almost clear for the sphere, but and um, that will say that at least for all Wilmore spheres that come from minimal sphere, we have an energy density even when the conformal class degenerates. And in particular, this will have interesting consequence for sequence of minimal surfaces with bonded area because your Wilmore energy becomes your area when h equals zero, for instance, in arbitrary co-dimension. So a lot is known for minimal surfaces in co-dimension one, but here we will have a kind of uh, compact, weak compactness result for uh, minimal surfaces in, a, in a asymptotically, no, in conformally flat space uh, in a arbitrary co-dimension. Uh, so, oh, uh, one minute. Uh, this is, um, yeah, because, so in our theorem, only C1 play a role, and it was uh, quite surprising because we expect that C0 and C1 play a role. Why? Because if you come back to a simpler problem, I mean, the basic one, harmonic maps. For harmonic maps, it proves that when the conformal class degenerates, you have an energy identity plus something, which is measured also by a residue, which is just an integration of the off differential around you, your chick. Uh, shrinking geodesic. So it's a result of Parker and Zoo. And so uh, since Wilmore was first order, we were expecting two residues because you have to integrate twice. Uh, you have two conservation laws. And, but only one play, play role. Uh, but that makes also the result optimal in the sense that there is a priori no expectation that C1, uh, um, we have no counterexample for the moment, where limit of Wilmore surfaces where C1 is um, non-zero. I mean, C1 uh, over the square root of the length. But a priori, it should exist because it exists for harmonic maps, which is a simpler problem. And to finish, I would like to present you this result. It's a new compactness result. And this is strongly linked with what I've said with the residue. So. Usually, we have compactness below 8 pi or below beta, beta g plus 4 pi. And now we are able to say that if you have a sequence of Wilmore surfaces whose energy is below 12 pi, then up to compose with some Mobius transformation, it is compact. And in fact, we can prove a bit more that, so it's improvement on, of old bond. In fact, in fact, assuming that the limit is not branch, we can even prove that uh, it's compact below beta g plus 12 pi, which is bigger than 16 pi. So we, we double the bound of compactness. And the idea is that you can glue a, a single bubble to a surface. That 4 pi is impossible, I mean, 
this picture, you can have a single blowup. You can have a sequence of source space that do this. Why? Why? Because here you should have something which is like a catenary. So what you say, you assume that you have a blow, blow up. You go, you pick your highest bubble, so you prove that it is a round sphere, or not a round sphere, a Wilmore sphere. And then in between, you pick a curve uh, with a smallest length. And this length must go to zero. And you make a dilution of your surface around this. So at the limit, you should see something like this, which will be a catenoid. But what I have to say, we can exclude catenoid easily. Thanks to the residue C, the first one. This one is not a geometric quantity, but a measure regularity in the following sense. That, so yeah, I will give you the exact theorem that if C is zero, so if you are a Wilmore immersion and you have a, a, on a punctured disk, you assume that the density is one, it's classical, then if C is zero, you can remove the singularity. But C is of course zero on the catenoid, but you can invert your catenoid. It looks like this. And this surface is not, sm is not smooth. Invert. It's not smooth, why? Because the catenoid has logarithm growth. So when you perform an inversion, here you look like R plus R square log R, something like this. And if you take two derivatives, it's blow up. H blows at this point, which is not clear on my picture, but. And if now you compute the value of C, so it's rotationally invariant, of course, around this circle, it's not zero. So now I will try to make it clear. Since here, when you pick the smallest curve, it's homotopic to a point. C must be zero because you are on a disk. So now if you blow something which looks like a catenoid, it's impossible. Why? Because just before passing to the limit, you perform your inversion here. And you are still, so you look like whatever. Here it's horrible. Here it's horrible. But C equals zero because C is invariant by inversion. Uh, C, and you are still here, this part is still um, homotopic to a disk, so the C is zero because it's a residue. Now you pass to the limit, and you have your inverted catenoid with C equals zero. It's not possible. Or if C were zero, you will say, okay, I can erase singularity, so I'm smooth here, I'm a smooth sphere, but if I'm a smooth sphere with, uh, with not a lot of energy, it means I'm a round sphere. So before inversion, I'm a plane. But a plane has only one end, it don't have two ends. So what we prove here is it's not a catenoid and it's not nothing with a logarithm, logarithmic growth. So the first minimal surfaces with no logarithm, logarithm growth have four ends, four flat ends. So the only possibility here is to have four N, one which is glue to your surface, and three other. Like, not easy to show, three ends like this. And those three ends should be closed, each one by four pi. So four pi, four pi, four pi. So the minimum of the blow up here is 12 pi plus the energy of your base manifold, which is at least the minimum beta g, which is known to be uh, four for, um, of course, a sphere, two p squared for a tori, and we don't know for higher dimension. So 
So now we have, uh, except in the case of branch point, uh, where we are below 12 pi, but if there is no branch point, the bound for compactness for wheel mode is now 16 pi. And I s thank you for your attention.